The Forgotten Mermaid, All Lost Hearts May Be Redeemed, by Gregor J. John. 19. Derek, the captain called out to the helmsman from the communication horn in his cabin. Steer the ship back up to the surface. Derek heard the order from the amplifying horn on deck. He looked at the other men, terrified and confused. They wandered about the deck within the globe of bizarre blue energy surrounding this underwater ship. The helmsman staggered over to the wheel and looked confused again. Derek had been a sailor for most of his life, but this ship that sailed under the ocean was beyond his wildest imaginings. Yet with an experienced sailor's eye and observant curiosity, the man reached out to pull gently on the wheel. Instead of being stable, the wheel post had now been released by secret toggle Bryce had flipped the day before. The whole steering column now leaned in with Derek's pull. The ship's prow tilted upwards. Derek smiled to himself and slowly steered the energized ship back up to Bob on the surface of the calm channel again. He then gave his brother orders to drop anchor, and the crew settled more calmly in the familiar atmosphere of open air, for as soon as they'd hit surface, the strange bubble of clear blue that surrounded the ship under water and kept them breathing dissipated like raindrops evaporating in the heated haze. The captain returned to working at his desk. Some hours later, Bailey was sweating and twitching and asleep. She was dreaming, and it wasn't pleasant. In her mind, she was back a few days before, stealing into the captain's cabin again, but this time, instead of a desk, there was a large stone cauldron in the centre of the cabin. It brewed a boiling, swirling storm within. Bailey floated toward the secret cabinet she had discovered, and it opened on its own. Inside, a glowing glass tube rested diagonally on a stand. The bottom end of the tube narrowed to a sharp point, whereas the other end was straight like a blowpipe. But the middle of the tube was bulbous and contained a thick, staining red liquid. Bailey saw her hand reach out and take the tube. The liquid inside was warm and seemed to pulse in her hand. With a swift movement, she stabbed her upper arm with a sharp end and the red juiciness inside propelled itself down the needle-like point and into her own bloodstream. She screamed. The burning was pulsing through her entire body and the skin began changing. She screamed again, but this time the scream was real enough to drag her out of subconscious terrors and Bailey woke up soaking wet and shivering. The first thing she saw was Mathilde, hovering in pale translucent form by the water bowl next to her bunk. "'You're nearly there, you know,' she whispered hauntingly. "'Piss off!' was Bailey's response. Mathilde laughed and cackled back. "'Even closer than you think.' "'Where's Bryce?' Bailey spat at her, trying to untangle her legs from the wet sheets she had soaked the bedclothes through with her night wrestling. "'He's resting.' The siren nodded backward. He has a big day ahead of him. Bryce was sacked out, leaning back in his chair with wide open mouth and heavy breathing. His head twitched as if trying to unsee something. Bailey moved to rouse him out of the stupor, but he was heavily under. The Bacht woman recognized magical handiwork. What have you done to him? she accused. It's just what I do, sweetie, Mathilde hovered with a bored look on her face. Bailey rushed her and ran right through the projected image that then laughed at her. Ignoring the wretched ghost, Bailey reached for a basin of cold water that was now in front of her and tossed the cold contents over Bryce's sleeping head. Mathilde instantly disappeared and Bryce woke up, caught choking and sputtering. What in the bloody hell? he yelled. Sorry, Bailey apologized. That wench was messing with our heads. Bryce blinked, trying to remember the haunting, then snorted in disdain. <sniffs> mm. He began tidying up his desk and himself, muttering, I'm not going to be able to take anyone with. But Bailey watched him, remembering her own haunting dreams. She asked, Why would she want to put her blood inside me? What? Bryce paused, attentive. Mathilde, she was putting images in my head of me stabbing myself with some tube filled with what looked like blood. Bryce froze. Why would she do that? Bailey kept asking. Where did you stab yourself? He walked to her side quickly, examining her neck and hands. 
I, I didn't really. It was just a dream, she reassured him. Yes, Bryce continued, flustering about her body, examining her skin and getting alarmingly personal about it. Bailey pushed him away, but he continued urgently. Where did you stab yourself in the dream? Bailey looked at him with great concern and raised her dream-stabbing hand to her dream-stabbed arm. She dared not actually look at it. Bryce gently folded up his sleeve to inspect the upper arm. Then he breathed a sigh of relief. You're okay. Nothing really happened. Bailey checked her arm herself and rubbed it, repeating her question, Why would she want to put her blood inside me? Likely it's not her blood she's trying to infect you with. Infect me? Bailey was now really worried. There was a bang outside as something heavy was dropped on the deck. Bryce moved to the door. Look, Bailey, there's a whole world out there hidden from you for your protection. He paused. But don't worry, I'll keep you safe. And he slammed out the door, running up to direct the traffic of trunks being carted onto his ship. Mathilde was moving in. Bailey wanted to move out. The woman stomped suddenly down to her own bunk and angrily began shoving all her belongings in her travel pack. Hastily, she snatched all her things together with a few of her husband's belongings and then stormed herself up to the deck, making an overt show of fed-up frustration. "'What are you doing?' young Daniel asked when she began tossing her belongings into the life's, ship's lifeboat. "'If she's moving in, I'm getting off!' Bailey yelled in a loud, scorn-filled voice. "'Ooh, I like that tone, honey,' Matilda encouraged. "'Keep that up.' "'You shut it,' Bryce warned the siren. "'You can't go anywhere without us, dear,' Reverend Tungsten consoled the lovely woman. "'Besides, there's nowhere else to go.' Bailey shrugged off his familiarity and stated, "'I have a whole bloody island to go to.' "'That's right,' Matilda crooned quietly under her breath. Dr. Scrandon appealed to the captain. Talk sense into the girl. She's gone mad. She's the only one thinking clearly, Bryce directed. The rest of you go and pack your bags too. What? The crew cried in unison, dropping all that they were doing. There was a shouting match as everyone disagreed with being left stranded on the horrific island of nightmares. Bryce quieted them all. Look, shut it! He breathed a space to ensure that he had everyone's attention. Matilde seated herself regally upon one of her trunks and listened with amusement. Bryce explained, I have been hired by the Lady Matilde's government to find her and bring her in for a view. I will now be taking her back to her home place, thus leaving the island empty. It's quite harmless without her on it, and it should stay put now, so you will be found soon enough. The doctor was always listening for scientific oddities, so he demanded, What do you mean the island should stay put? Ah! Oh! The captain lost his patience. I don't have time to explain the mysteries of energy or the worlds that are hidden a blink away from what you all. He threw the last of Bailey's belongings into the lifeboat and became as threatening as he could, growling, I'm the captain of this ship, and when I tell you the journey is no longer safe for you, I will put you off my ship and you will do as I say. And he yelled, he yelled and that is final. Matilde snickered, proud of her tempestuous stirring. See? Bryce pointed right at her mocking pose. He continued yelling at them. I'm yelling at you because she is messing with my energy. He just got louder. If you don't, say, if you don't do as I say now, we, we will all be at each other's throats by sunset. The crew looked agitated. Do you want to die? Screamed the captain. The men all scrambled to go and fetch their own belongings. None of them wanted any more of the drama unfolding around them. Things had just escalated beyond weird, and they all just wanted off the ride. Bailey began unloading her things off the lifeboat and calmly carried them back toward the hatch. Where are you going? The exasperated Bryce snapped at her. Bailey calmly turned to face him. Obviously, you can't handle yourself alone with the wench. You need help, and I'm the only one without a dick. Therefore, I'm the only one who can help you. Mathilde laughed raucously. You stupid woman! You are me! She mocked again. Bailey took a deep breath and responded. Not yet, I'm not. Bryce was flabbergasted, infuriated, and kept silent by the siren. Mathilde sauntered sensually toward Bailey, getting up close to her ears and neck as she circled and whispered. But how can you resist the call? She hissed at her. Bailey dropped her head and closed her eyes, breathing calmly and praying silently in her mind. 
When she opened her eyes again, she beheld the bloodthirsty, scorned and shattered woman before her with a new perspective. Reaching out a hand, the missionary gently caressed Mathilde's cheek and said with deep sincerity, I forgive you. Mathilde hissed and the spell broke on Bryce. He interrupted, You can't stay. Not if you don't let me, I can't. Bailey looked at him with genuine care. Bryce stuttered, But I... You, your husband just died and it's my responsibility to keep you safe. Bailey smiled quietly as the other men began returning to deck with all their possessions in hand. They walked a wide arc around and away from the siren, all too eager to be done with the bitch. Continuing in her soothing voice, Bailey melted the captain's heart with her resolution and rational reasoning. If you want to keep me safe, then keep me. Don't leave me behind on an island as a single woman with five and a half men. Daniel took offence. A half? But Mathilde was not done with her challenger. The siren coaxed. She's right. It's not her safety you should be worried about. Looking off to what had been her home prison for the last decade, the forgotten mermaid declared, If you leave her alone on that island, she will likely be the only survivor, and she will take my place. Bryce sighed. Bailey looked curiously at Mathilde and corrected her, You seem awfully confident of what I will and will not do. Do not presume to know me by your own scorn and bitterness. Mathilde snapped sullenly at Davies, who had strayed closer to her in his effort to pack the lifeboat. Davies jumped and looked to hoist the lifeboat over the edge of the ship by himself. He urged, Are we out of here or what? He cleared his throat to try and look commanding. Sirens and sailors have always been a bad mix. Daniel and Derek joined their brother and began pulling the ropes to get their escape over the side of the ship. The gentlemen scholars tossed their belongings in and helped with the hoisting. Bryce let the men be in his bewilderment of what to do with this powerfully strong human woman. Then he looked at the dangerous siren and sentenced her. You will spend the entire journey locked in the lowest hold. There are plenty of energy source down there in the workings. You will be quite comfortable. But more importantly, it will keep us safe from your tanglings. Bailey took her cue from the us and continued down the hatch to return her be belongings she would claim her place beside the captain on the ship that had become her home. Thus, with scrambled parting, the five and a half men dropped their lifeboat into the still waves and began rowing out of the channel current. Bryce smirked almost mischievously and asked the siren, You want to help them onto shore one last time? Carefully, he emphasized. The siren smirked and dove off into the waves in front of them. The sailors screamed and clung to the boat edges as they swirled and swirled around in a whirlpool that sucked them down. The boat spun wildly in an energized blue bubble under water beneath the waves and in under the cliffs and into the dark tunnels full of the oversized sea creatures. The men stared with wide-eyed horror as their human minds burst in fear of the unknown. But almost as quickly as they were sucked under, they were then spat out again onto the small strip of sand with nothing but a cliff face at their back and the tumultuous rocky sea in front. The cliffs were climbable, burning with great effort. The men stayed where they'd been spat out and flopped onto the sand in exhaustion, blind to the pursuit, as Captain Deleuze sailed out of the rocks safely below the waves. Lady Mathilde regally stalked below the deck, escorted by a newly invigorated Bailey. The two women faced off, each strong in her own power, the siren relying upon her bitter energy, the missionary woman relying upon her divine comfort. Bailey smiled as she locked the de jail door and returned topside. Bryce was more encouraged than he liked to admit as Bailey joined him at the helm. He cheekily grinned and said, You ready for this? No, she giggled. But go ahead anyway. Bryce raised his hand, stepping away from the wheel, and Bailey felt a strange sense of great energy build up before him. He pushed his arms out, and the whole ship suddenly sped through what looked like a twisting whirlpool under the oceans. They sailed deeper and deeper, picking up speed as they sank. <laughs>